Hello, can I have your attention, please? Thank you. Before I introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, I'd just like to make one small comment. We had a slight cock up with the posters. Uh, we only got the room quite late yesterday because we had another conference here before. And um, uh, we actually have the label wrongly positioned. It will be sorted uh, and we will avoid this uh, congestion, uh, but it will be sorted only tonight because it will take us a couple of hours. You have nothing to do, we will take care of it. Uh, and it will, uh, it will be a, a more sensible plan uh, for tomorrow. So uh, I do apologize for uh, the inconvenience. <coughs> Anyways, so let's now actually focus on um, something much more exciting. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Claire Tompani. Uh, Dr. Tompani is professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School, and she's as well a diagnostic radiologist. She also holds the Ferenc Jolais Chair of Radiology Research, actually the first chair, um, at the Department of Radiology at the Brigham and Women Hospital. She's a principal investigator of the P41 National Center of Image Guided Therapy grant and the medical director of the Advanced Multimodal Image Guided Operating Suite, which is perhaps more known as Amigo, which is an absolute outstanding um, uh, suite uh, to uh, do research in image guided surgery. Uh, Dr. Tampani is an expert in body MRI, uh, specifically in pelvic MRI, uh, with a very strong focus on prostate cancer. She leads a, a very large um, prostate research program, which includes diagnostic, uh, staging, and MR ultrasound guided, inter guided intervention and treatment guidance programs. Some other of her interests are in image guided therapy, including computer assisted technology development for multimodal image display in the operating room. And since 2000, she's been very active uh, in uh, developing and conducting very successful multiple trials for MR-guided focus ultrasound surgery. She has completed three trials um, in this area, um, and as well for treatment for, of uterine um, uh, fibroid and ongoing trials for treatment of metastatic bone tumors for palliation of pain. And our talk today will be focusing on multimodal image guided therapy, novel personalized approaches in oncology and beyond. Please, let's welcome Dr. Tompani. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Seb. That was a really delightful introduction. Thank you and for the extraordinary honor to speak to you all today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Sandy and all of the Co the organizing committee, um, really very grateful to be here and to share with you the work of all of the people that I work with and beyond. Um, some disclosures that are required, we obviously have grant funding, we work with multiple vendors and industry partners in developing many of the tools and technologies that you'll see today. I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Frank, Frank who was the mentor and visionary behind everything that we do at the Brigham and beyond, uh, is the father, or the, mod the father of modern day image guided therapy. Um, who said, of course, that to use any form of medical imaging to plan, perform, and evaluate surgical procedures and therapeutic interventions. And that's why we're all here, that's why you're here at this meeting, and thank you for doing, that great, for doing this great work. I also want to thank all of the people on the slide here who are the local team uh, at the Brigham. All of these people's work will be touched on during this talk. I hope I can acknowledge them individually as I go, but if I leave one out, apologies. I hope I have all the photos right. Clinical partners and collaborators at the Brigham, we work with an enormous number of people, both at the Brigham and outside. We work in a very multidisciplinary teams, working with surgeons, radiation oncologists, and all our interventional radiologists as well. And that's really a very big, big part of this, that this is translational research that we're talking about. This is real clinical care. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of an overview of where we are with some of the challenges in healthcare. It's obviously a slightly US-centric perspective but much of it that will relate to all of you, I'm sure, around the world. Um, and then take a little bit of a deep dive into, first of all, the resources, the tools, and the technologies that we use in all of our translational programs. Touch a little on five of the cancers as listed there, and then conclude with touching a little bit on non-invasive image guided therapy. I will not speak greatly on focused ultrasound surgery, as you will have an expert keynote speaker on Yoav Medin speaking about that on Wednesday. So I'll then conclude with some talks about nanotechnology. 
So what's going on? There are lots of people who have the ability to look into crystal glass balls or whatever and predict where we're going and what's going to change and what's going to drive healthcare. You can read about any of them, but this is just five from the uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Health Research Institute report. Obviously, we all know about the wearables. I have my Fitbit on, Tina, here it is. I'm wearing it today. We all wear something, nearly all of us anyway, something to monitor our activities. And there's been a significant shift from the, patient, the doctor's opinion to the patient's opinion about how they manage their health care and how they look after themselves. And I think that's fantastic, and we should applaud that. One of the big things that's certainly hitting radiology in a big way is this shift from volume-based practice of medicine and radiology to value-based. FPS means fee per service, has been the way we've all been reimbursed to do what we do in healthcare in the United States. So the more you do, the more you get paid. And that's the, that's the volume story. And that's been the problem. And that's really led to the huge crisis that we have today in healthcare. So value, now we're really focusing on value. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what that might mean. And then more relevant to all of you are the technical advances and digitization that's going on and the predictors there. Decentralization of care. We obviously recognize that by able to be able to connect with each other through Skype and Google Hangouts and everything, healthcare doesn't have to be in one building anymore. You don't have to travel millions of miles to get something done. Centralization is a big deal. And then, of course, health management. So tech advances and digitization, a little broader deep into that. So obviously the mining of the electronic medical record and health data has become an enormous area of interest. The big data, the deep learning that you know about so well, um, and really how that's being actually done is really important. 3D printing has a, has a role to play, um, certainly in the education of the patients and certainly for modeling and devices and practicing and phantoms and education, very important. The so-called blockchain technology, which is the Bitcoin model, I think we'll see move into healthcare, um, very important as well. Omics, the whole field of omics means genomics, metabolomics, radiomics, you name it, as an omics. What are those things and how do we integrate all of those? A huge part of it and obviously because so much of the data is digital and as you saw nicely illustrated this morning in lung cancer, digitization of pathology is the next big frontier and it's really beginning to happen and of course machine learning tools and neural networks to interpret the pathology will change a lot and will help us enormously with our images because we'll now have better, better correlation of exactly voxel by voxel what we're seeing. And then, of course, artificial intelligence. I'll come back to that again at the end. And so the volume to, va to value. What is value in healthcare? And so this is just one quote, and I think it's a fairly good one. Value really is essentially what happens over how much it costs. And so really it's the patient experience in healthcare, and that's something that we're all beginning to think a lot more about. It seems like a da-da moment. Well, why didn't we think about this before? The patient is the person receiving the care. But before we treated nearly all patients in the same way. We used to have a single changing room in our MRI scanner for men and women. You know, we used to have a single bathroom. I mean, <laughs> you know, all kinds of me don't talk about bathrooms. But anyway, um, it's really been a, quite the change. I mean, it seems like a really da-da thing. But anyway, patient experience. So telling patients what they're consenting to, really helping them understand how they're managing their care, tailoring treatment to risk, and then, of course, improving the consistency of care. We have an enormous problem with inconsistency. We have inconsistency within our own institution, an MRI scan at the Dana-Farber versus one at the Brigham versus one at the Faulkner Hospital. All three hospitals that we work in are all different. The scans will look different. They'll be interpreted differently. Where are we with that? Why is that happening? That's a, really a big problem. We have a new chairman who's taking this on now. Protocolization, standardization, very important. And then the costs. Obviously, these are the big, the big drivers here. We really need to tailor it to patient preference. Many patients don't want to be aggressively treated. Many patients don't desire certain things that we might think are really good for them. We have to get our values lined up so that we're doing the right thing. And then avoiding it when it's not beneficial. That's critical, of course. And so Vivian Lee, who's a friend of mine who used to be a radiologist in, um, in, at NYU, published this really interesting article. I'm not going to go in detail, but really what she's trying to do at Utah Healthcare is she's now the CEO there. Um, is to really give doctors the information they need to make good decisions, to talk to their patients, to inform them about what they're doing and give them feedback. So they're doing online evaluations, just like you do for a restaurant on Yelp. You can now review your doctor at Utah Healthcare, give them stars or no stars, tell them exactly what they did or didn't do. And this is really making a difference. Some of the doctors, obviously, it's not nice to hear that somebody thought you were really obnoxious and you kept them waiting an hour. These are really important parts of healthcare delivery. We have to fix those. And so that's helping. Now, it's really interesting. One that I came across recently was this slide. 
we all know human decision making is really complicated. Um, we know that it's certainly not uniform. There are essentially way more than two types, but this sort of, sim sim sort of summarizes it briefly into how doctors or patients make decisions. Type one is that automatic, that intuitive, that gut reaction that's really easy to use, it's reflexive, but we know it's not always right. That's the one that most people like to use because it feels good. It feels like that's the decision. So it feels like you should order an MRI. It feels like we should take your leg off. I don't know. But those kinds of decisions, gut reactions are really, really not really the most sensible ones sometimes. So type two, this is where I think Andre Fedorov leads us. Somebody who like him, who thinks logically precise and analytical, hard to do. It's resource intensive, but it's almost always right. And used only when forced, is that what most doctors. So this is the space in which I think we can work a lot more in, in combining doctors' opinions with tools like artificial intelligence or CAD or whatever computer-aided diagnostic tools you can develop that will actually help the doctor integrate all the data. There's just way too much data out there right now. And as you can see, we have way too many imaging modalities. But these are some of the, the modalities that are being used and tested both in clinical and preclinical cancer today. Um, and the integration of all of those is really what we're going to talk a little bit about now. So one of the things before we get into the clinical examples, again, is as we all know in imaging, what we're doing is we're doing personalization through phenotyping. By taking that person's images, using them and computing them into being a biomarker, which may be specific or nonspecific for that disease. Using biochemical tissue characterization, such as vascular flow, angiogenesis quantification, PK, pharmacokinetic analyses of dynamic contrast flow, all of these things are really great, taking deeper dives into the phenotyping. All of these are familiar to you. I don't need to tell you. And Alex Goby works with us in neurosurgery, shared this slide with me, and really wants you to understand that before we start talking about cancer, surgical removal of cancer is still the most common way to treat cancer. So removing that mass, removing that tumor, so it, one of the most important challenges to us in the imaging space is to define the edges of that tumor, its margin, its definition, that's critical. It may be nice to be able to demonstrate results for the diagnosis of a cancer by looking at the most aggressive part in the middle, and that's important, don't get me wrong, but it's sort of like, as Frank would say, it's the tails of the curve on the sides, the margins of that tumor, where it starts to peter out into normal tissue that really matters to surgeons, to radiation oncologists, to almost anyone who's treating to try to remove the entire thing or to treat the whole thing. So remember that. And so now I'm gonna tell you about the resources and the tools and the technology that we're very fortunate to have at the Brigham Hospital, which is the Amigo Suite opened in 2011, the brainchild of Frank and the vision of his combined with the leadership of the NIH helped us build this space along with the president of the hospital and Gary Gottlieb and others who obviously spent the funding. And we've had a large NIH support for that over the years. Currently, we are in our third of five cycles and it's now called a P41 and these are some of the leaders of the cores. Many of them are familiar to you and are in the audience today. And so it was a long dream. We started with a magnet in an operating room for neurosurgery that allowed surgeons to image at the same time of surgery. That's the MRT in the bottom left there, um, which you can see here. And that was the General Electric uh, device, which was fantastic. You didn't have to move the patient at all. The magnet was there all the time. It operated at 0.5 Tesla. And that's where we really cut our teeth in this whole space and learned about using things in MR environments that were safe and wouldn't damage the patient and how to monitor what we were doing. And then it went on to Amigo. Amigo is three spaces, three rooms, an operating room in the middle with a Dynacone beam CT, uh, an MRI room, which is a three Tesla Siemens device, on rails integrated by Imaris, which allows it to move into the room when you want to use it in the operating room, and then a, a PET scanner, a PET CT scanner at the other end for PET CT imaging. The concept behind it really is about validation of tissue imaging and validation of what we're seeing voxel by voxel and being able to use that information to determine the margin, the place to biopsy, the place to ablate, as you'll see, varying tools for treatment of tissue. One of the most important tools that we use, of course, is the slicer, which is, of course, familiar to all of you. 3D slicer, pioneered and, and um, passionately led by Ron Kikinis and many others in the audience. Um, which is a very, very important tool, the open source software which allows us to do great registration, modalities, multimodal fusion, segmentation of the critical anatomy, the normal structures around the prostate, whatever, um, and of course, statistical analysis of the data, critical, critical to all our success. And Janucci Takuda and others have developed links between that and the scanners that allow us to use this uh, to track instruments and robots through the OpenIGT link. 
So today, as of today, Tina kindly shared this with me yesterday. We've done over, two, over 1,200 cases in Amigo. This gives you a perspective of the types of cases that we're all doing there, and they all use imaging and image guidance at some point during the procedure. Um, as you can see, we're really getting to be diverse and touch in many, many aspects of patient care. So I'm going to start off with my favorite program, no biases here, but the prostate cancer program um, is really the place where I sort of cut my teeth a lot on understanding how to use images during procedures. Through the integration of the slicer, we were able to show Dr. D'Amico where to put radiation sources in the very beginning when we were doing MR-guided brachytherapy, and then we moved that into a biopsy program about 20 years ago, 18 years ago now, to do sampling directly in the bore of the magnet. And now we're using it with robotic enabling tools and are using the robotic enabling tools to guide needles and probes for ablation, as you can see in the top right there, for cryotherapy. And these are the team and the people that I work with. Why are we doing this? So here's a case. Now, you may never have seen a prostate MRI until today, but what you're looking at is a 62-year-old man who had a PSA level of 15. PSA should be four or less, relatively, so 15 is really high. So he had a biopsy, and it showed positive one out of five cores. You can see all this up here. One out of five cores, biopsy positive on the left with a Gleason 3 plus 3. Now, if you've never seen a prostate MR before, you still might be able to see the large mass, and you know about an anatomical orientation. That large mass is on the right side of the prostate. So it didn't show up in the report here. What's going on? So this lesion, as you can see here, and then you can see it here in the dynamic subtraction, here on the ADC, and then these are all the PK images, all showing that nice red area where the tumor lives. That was not sampled at the time of biopsy, because that biopsy was done during, during using standard transrectal ultrasound guidance, which is non-targeted, sees nothing inside the prostate except the fact the prostate is present, literally, and now can, as you've heard, is getting better, and there are many, many new and exciting tools in ultrasound, but at the time of this, they were not, of course, being used, and they're not routinely used in the clinic yet. Standard ultrasound is grayscale interpretation. So we have a real sampling problem here. And so the sampling problem clearly is trying to hit the target. And how do we solve that? Well, so through using the slicer, we've used this now. This is video on, that you're seeing is a really old video from many years ago when we started first in the MRT days, where you're seeing a T2-weighted image and a lesion that's down here, and then a needle going towards that, all displayed in a single frame so that I, as the operator, could see exactly where my needle was going and the previously acquired T2-weighted images, which showed me the pathology much better than the real time did. So that obviously was a major advance, and we've exploited that ever since. And so today we do our guidance, our biopsy guidance, inside the three Tesla magnet using a transperineal plate, basically, and we use that to sample the prostate. And what's so really good about this is not does it only sample the image-based abnormality, but it samples the heterogeneous tissue inside that abnormality. So this image now shows you there's an area in, of diffusion restriction in an area that I didn't see on the T2, so I can sample that as well by good registration. And the next image, if it comes up there, is the DCE color-coded to show me where the K-trans abnormality is, and I can put my needle into the K-trans abnormality. So then I can get direct pathology feedback based on each core from where they came from. And so we've been doing this for quite some time and had fortunately enough, enough NIH funding to keep going the distance. And luckily now, I think we're able to sit back and sort of clap ourselves a little bit on the back because many, many people have recognized now that MR guidance is needed at some level in sampling the prostate. And there are many companies and many people getting involved in this space now with new devices, be they for cognitive fusion biopsies or fusion alone or for MR guidance in bore or out of bore. And there's a dizzying array of options out there and we're struggling to figure out the good things and the bad things. So the new day is finally dawning clinically, and I mean sort of globally things are beginning to change. And we see now that the problems of sampling, and this nice image from, from uh, the UCL group really shows it beautifully, I think, the sampling problem when you just go systematically without a good target. And so being able to fuse ultrasound and MRI is, is a very, very, very exciting space. And this is the most pragmatic one, where you take the MR image from a month or so ago, and your weeks, or day or two, whatever, and then you fuse it with ultrasound, using ultrasound in real time to do the sampling, informed by the MRI. And that's going to help us enormously. And we'll learn as we go that, MR, that ultrasound, no doubt, will be better than we know it is today in the standard clinical interpretation. So these are the options that are available, they're both in-bore and out-of-bore. Um, in-bore obviously takes up a little magnet time, and it's a little bit challenging if you don't have magnet access. We love it. It samples any part of the prostate any time. The anterior prostate is easy to access. The out-of-bore is a little bit less, less easy. 
And the solution is clearly find the target and hit it. And that's really what this has been all about in the biopsy world. The robotic developments working with the group at Hopkins and WPI and Queens and Acoustic Med has led us to this device, which allows us to use an enabling technology to reach parts of the prostate that may be challenging without with just using a physician's hand. And so this is Dr. Tunkali, who leads the clinical program there, using this new device, which we've developed uh, through a BRP grant, which I think is very exciting as well. And smarter biopsy devices will definitely become more available They're already coming out. These are some of the fusion systems that are on the market. Many of them uh, you're all familiar with. Many of you are responsible for developing the registration codes and algorithms that are used by these. Um, and I think we need to compare and understand all of these. And I put a little plea to you guys, try to compare registration techniques, understand those, um, and see and help us figure out which one is right or best. And what is the value of all of this? I talked about value earlier. So where are we with the costs of this? The cost effectiveness studies are really beginning to roll out. These are several of them going down to 2015. There's five that have been published now. I'm highlighting them simply because I want to show you the geographical diversity. They're looking at prices in the UK, we're looking at prices in Europe, and now more recently in the US and in Canada. So this is exactly what we need, and all of these papers are saying the same thing. The results are that the MR integrated into a biopsy is cost effective and will make a difference because what it's doing is stopping us biopsying everybody. Previously, we were biopsying everybody that had a PSA abnormality and a finger that felt something. And so we're over biopsying, over detecting, and over treating. So now we'll be able to pull back safely and say, you need a biopsy, you don't need a biopsy. And so that's really where the cost effectiveness and savings will come in. And so lots is going on in that space and we really need to think and understand the cost effective ratios um, and what those mean in healthcare. And there's lots about this that goes into what is the CEA analysis, decision systems are needed, decision analytics, many variables and many factors that have to be factored into where you're reading these papers from, um, what country you're talking about, what the local costs are. So this is in a whole sphere of research in itself. So leaving the prostate, let's talk a little bit about breast cancer. One of the biggest problems of breast cancer surgery is that when a lumpectomy is performed, about 20 to even 40% of the time, residual tumor is left behind positive surgical margins. It's like the worst thing that can happen to the patient and the doctor. You get the path report back, the specimen is at the edge, it means that there's still cancer in her body. You have to go back in again and do a second surgery. And it's very common, no matter who the surgeon is and where they are. They're doing their best to try to fix that problem. We think we have a way to help them with imaging, um, and we've been testing that through Ava Gombos and others in our group, as I'll share with you in a minute. The first one was fairly obvious. It was that breast MRI examinations are typically performed in the prone position. So the woman lies on her stomach on the table, obviously to examine the breast as best possible. And so these images here are the prone position images, and then this is a supine image. And you can see by the segmented data by, done by, uh, in the 3D slicer that the blue and the green are sort of miles apart. I mean, it's pretty obvious. You change the position, the tumor is going to be in a different place. So how can you use a preoperative MRI in the prone position to help surgery in the supine position? And so now what we've actually successfully been able to do after this publication this summer is change all of the preoperative imaging protocols to include at least one supine exam before the patient gets out of the magnet pre-surgery so that there are two images that show the range of movement on that day. And I agree that they are not exactly perfect because on the day of surgery she'll be in a slightly different position again. But it's a very important first step. And the next phase of it is really what I'll share with you in a minute is one of the more interesting is looking at the intraoperative imaging and looking at what we do during the scan or during the actual surgery. So if we can play video one, you will see that this is the pre-procedural imaging. The patient's on the table in the operating room in the middle of the Amigo room and the IMRA scanner is coming in to scan the breast and take images at the baseline of before, prior to the surgeon manipulating the breast. And you can stop and go to video two, please. And now you can see they're palpating and trying to figure out where should we cut. I mean, it's really, you know, they've used the images, they have them on the screen, um, and now they're going in to make an incision and remove what they believe to be the mass. And you can stop and please play video three. Uh, sorry, these ones don't run automatically, so. But anyway, that's great. So this is now, we're doing imaging after the lumpectomy. And so this is a DCE kinetic analysis, so red is bad and red is cancer. And you can see that we've got little, oops, it was right there a second ago, sorry. Do you want to just try playing three again? Can we do that? Is that possible? Three again? Um, sorry. 
So it comes in, yep, and then you'll see the red in the breast itself. You see the heart, which dominates everything, of course, but you see this little red area here. That's residual tumor within that lumpectomy bed. Thank you, and then we can just play video four. Um, so that gave the surgeon that information at the time of the surgery so that he was able to go immediately back in again without waking her up and without stopping the anesthesia. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, if I can get it to move. There we go. So now we're going to change and talk a little bit about Alex Golby's brain tumor program, this fabulously colored slide. Um, big challenges in brain surgery. The two critical challenges are identifying normal brain structures that you don't want to damage, and the other one, of course, is the margin. And the margin of the tumor, again, is the repetitive theme. But trying to determine are there breadcrumbs, as Frank would call them, breadcrumbs of tumor left behind in the cavity. Um, so we're applying some very exciting novel technology. And the most exciting one in my mind is the so-called mass spectrometry, which I'll share with you in a minute, which allows us to go way beyond looking at just standard histopathological analysis, but gives us an in instantaneous metabolic feedback as to what's going on inside. And so the same sort of loop of what's going on in the brain surgery program as in the prostate. And before we look at the pathology, just an FYI, this is a nice slide that Ron lent me, um, is the genomics of gliomas. One of the important features on the genetic analysis of these tumors is the IDH mutations here, the IDH, the dehydroxylase one, which is the mutations which occur in about 30% of gliomas. Um, and an inhibitor, which is one that would block it in that patient if that patient has this mutation, is currently in just starting a phase one clinical trial. So it would be important to be able to determine the presence or absence of this uh, mutation. And this is really what Natalie Agar and her group here with working with Alex, we have a mass spectrometer in the operating room just, around, just inside the PET CT scanner room where they take the tissue now we immediately into the mass spectrometer and are able to deliver this kind of information of the metabolic ch chemical feedback of what's been seen in that tissue at the time of the surgery. And until recently, that was taken offline and the data wasn't analyzed or used in the patient's surgical procedure. But now, just last week, we got approval, or last two weeks ago, we got approval from the IRB to actually use this information inside the, inside the magnet. And working with Sandy and everybody else, we're now able to register much of this data in the slicer so that we can tell exactly what part of the tumor that abnormality is coming from. So we have a three-dimensional display of this data. The data itself has also been very powerful and has actually, at least in one case, been more informative than the standard histopathological examination. And so really interesting results there, so watch that space. So moving on to gynecological cancer, radiation delivery is done typically using CT or X-ray. Now CT and X-ray are all very fine for some certain things, as we were talking about in one of the breaks today. But really, to see soft tissue tumors and masses in the pelvis, CT and X-ray just don't cut it. They don't show you the abnormality. They barely show you where the cervix is, the bladder, of course, and the bones. But you, can you tell the difference between the rectal wall and the cervical tumor, in that case, not on CT? And so really what the whole radiation oncology field is recognizing, and many of you will know about this already, is that the integration of both MRI and MRI and PET and then not just the imaging, but the therapy, so the MR Linux system, all of these hybrid systems are becoming clinically evalu evaluated and are in testing at the moment. And the most exciting is probably the MR Linux, where you can combine the imaging and the delivery at the time. But certainly, we've been using MRI, and you can see now in this patient, the exquisite images that can show you where the tumor is, the normal uterus above the bladder, and then the rectum back here, completely spared, no tumor there. So you would know exactly where to deliver the therapy to. And working with Akilo Visvanathan and others, I'll show you in a second, but here's a PET scan which shows you similar findings of the biologically active tumor on an FDG tracer. And so using that information, the DVH or the dose volume histogram can be plotted really carefully with the radiation oncologist so that you tighten the margin of where you're really treating and where you don't need to treat. And these are tumors that have been treated for years with a lot of toxicity, bladder leakages, ruptures of the colon, all kinds of horrible things would happen to these patients because you were over-treating the normal tissues. So being able to tighten up these isobars for the radiation delivery is a huge advance in the success of successful delivery. And so using the MRI images, we've been able to help them with that. One of the most important parts of this was the interstitial program where Akilo Visvanathan, who was our radiation oncologist, would be placing catheters into the soft tissue through the vagina, placing these catheters, as you can see here, 
into the tissue to deliver radiation through the high dose rate delivery afterwards. This isn't real-time delivery, it's real-time imaging of catheters for subsequent delivery. And so we've been able to help with helping design an active tracking needle um, program led by Wei Wang and published here. As you can see, we're tracking each and every one of these catheters. There may be as many as 20 of these at a given time inside the pelvis. And so knowing where each, every, each and every one is is very important and very complicated to track. And so Wei did some fantastic work in helping us track those. As you can see, they were then registered to CT images afterwards. And look at these CTs. You can't see the tumor. You can just about see the, the, uh, the tracking needles. So that's been a big advance of using different techniques to help guide the delivery of radiation. Now, what are we doing in lung cancer? Lung cancer presents a very interesting dilemma. First of all, we've had a major success with the screening of lung cancer using low-dose CAT scans or low-dose CT. So low-dose CT has now have received a grade B from the U.S. Preventative Task Force Agency. Anything below a C is regarded as not useful and will not be paid for. So a B is pretty close to an A. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So it's now been approved, and this is now reimbursed by most of the U.S. health uh, insurance programs. So smokers, people at risk, are getting low-dose CT scans now to look for nodules. Now nodules are tiny little, tiny little dots inside the lung parenchyma, which may or may not be cancer. And in fact, the vast majority are not cancer. Most of them are related to things like histoplasmosis or prior tuberculosis exposure on benign granulomas. So there's a dilemma when we find these nodules, who has cancer, who doesn't. So the recommendation at the moment is that you biopsy and or resect all lesions greater than one centimeter. And we expect that many of them, less than two centimeters, are smaller and growing. And there's a big increase in demand now for surgery to remove these small little nodules. So you're going in knowing that the majority may be benign, you can't characterize them, so you want to do a very minimal surgery. You really want to be able to take out as little lung as possible. So here are the challenges and here are some of the solutions in this clinical scenario. The challenge is to get good imaging characterization, to do a really targeted accurate biopsy of a tiny nodule, to localize for the surgeon where is that nodule, and then help him or her with her palpation technique to find it in the operating room. And I'll show you why that's an issue in a minute. So solutions, radiomics, clearly a really big role to play here in helping us separate out by imaging, and then of course radiogenomics later on, on which tumors need to be treated, which don't. PET-CT guidance for biopsy is very helpful. PET-CT has a problem with resolution of things less than a centimeter, so one to two is pretty reasonable. They can probably track that. So we're testing that in Amigo. Hybrid operating rooms using cone beam CT, which is what we're doing at the Brigham with Dr. Bueno and Dr. Colson you'll see in a minute, helps enormously for localization and tracking where is that little nodule in a collapsed lung and using a thing called a T-bar to localize it. And then the work that Hugo Ertz and Ron and many people are now working on, which is in radiomics, is really the feature analysis and the extraction from CT of feature analytic techniques to help us tell maybe, is this a real lung cancer, is it not? Is it a small cell or a non-small cell? And so looking again at the lung nodules and the masses, they're all very different shapes, different locations, which is benign, which is malignant, very challenging to be able to tell. But we can certainly start by doing feature extractions and analyzing them. The genomics itself has presented a huge dilemma. Forever, there's been two kinds of lung cancer, to small cell and non-small cell. And now if you look at the non-small cells, there are so many different genetic mutations associated with all of these non-small cells that it's becoming very, very interesting. There's not just this great big group of non-smalls that you can treat them all the same way. If you find one that has a BRAF mutation, for example, that's only about one to 3% of all lung cancer. So you're now talking about a common disease becoming a rare disease. And if it has that mutation, you'll treat it very differently than you will one that, say, has a P10 mutation. And so the determination of the mutation is now critical for the successful treatment of that patient. And so we are working with Dr. Bueno, just the next step really is beyond the radiomics, is to really look and see what can we do during the actual surgery. Can we reduce the slice of pizza, the size of the slice of pizza, as I like to think of it? So this is a wedge resection for a partial lobectomy for a patient with a small lung nodule. You can see the lung nodules in different images here. You can see this beautiful three-dimensional segmented from slicer image showing exactly where it is. But how does he know where it is when he's in the operating room? And that's a very interesting problem. And if I get to the next slide. So sorry, the first plan is to try to reduce the size of that pizza slice so we can take out a tiny piece of lung with the nodule in it. And the stressor is on with the nodule in it, obviously. 
but we want to take out as little lung as possible because you need all the air cells you have. You know, you get a little short of breath when you climb the Acropolis like I did yesterday. We need every alveolus inside our lungs, so we don't want to remove normal lung if we don't have to. So let's try to get the slice down to be really small. And so here's what happens during the surgery. So what does the surgery involve? Standard surgery, VATS, video-assisted thoracic surgery. They collapse the lung that they're operating on. They preferentially ventilate the normal lung, the side that doesn't have the nodule in it, and use that one for the surgery to, to oxygenate the patient. Collapse down deliberately the lung with the nodule in it. Now what happens between the inflated to the deflated lung, what well, is just like taking a sponge in the bathtub and squeezing all the water out of it, the thing just gets completely different. You've squeezed this, you've decompressed it, you've deflated it. The nodule is now impossible to find because the situation looks completely different than it did on the chest CT preoperatively. So the surgeon has to use his or her fingers to try to find that nodule. Now the princess and the pea, they are not. So it is really hard to find those nodules. And they can spend up to an hour palpating the lung just to find a nodule. So think about that for a second. So what we've done with Jay and others is to really, to really, oops, I've got to go back. I thought I'd end the slide there. Is to place a little T-bar percutaneously into the lung, if I go back one more. Yeah. So we place a little T-bar into the lung near the nodule and ahead of time. So that's a guide wire, a simple guide wire, just to show the surgeon where the nodule is located. And then he palpates down along the guide wire into the region of the lung and removes only that wedge resection. And so we've done that now in about 25 patients, and some of the results are here. Um, successful in 87 in placing the T-bar to help localize the lesion um, with relatively short periods of time. And then again, interestingly, we had um, 22 of those nodules were all malignant, so they were a well-selected population. So the malignancy rates were higher than you might have expected, and all nodules successfully removed. So I think that's an example of a mechanical assistance using DynaCT, a simple, rel relatively simple tool that can be done in an operating room, a hybrid operating room outside Amigo, very portable. This program now doesn't have to be done in Amigo anymore. It's gone to a standard operating room and a very effective way to reduce the surgery time and, of course, the outcome for the patient. I want to finish a little bit of a clinical application just talking, I think, promise I only have two slides on this because obviously I could talk for an hour on this very exciting subject, but you'll get that tomorrow. Um, such a great organization to have an, a separate talk on this. But MR-guided focused ultrasound surgery is sort of the, the, the epitome of non-invasive imaging and image-guided therapy. You use the images to generate the target information, the non-target information. You use the images using phase contrast on MR to show where the temperature is and to get real-time thermometry feedback, as you can see here, using the phased array transducers focused on a spot. You can do incredibly exciting things. This is uterine fibroid treatment setup. This is the transducer around the head, the cranial transducer, um, which allows delivery of the energy through the skull into the brain. And that in and of itself was a huge feat of engineering and imaging science because ultrasound does not move through bone, as you all know, very easily. So d Greg Clement and Claire Vohinanen and Nathan McDonald and Frank and others developed the w a methodology to image the patient using CT images of the skull, the thickness of the skull um, mantle, and calculate that into an algorithm that allows the ultrasound waves to pass through the skull. And that's probably the most exciting thing that's going on in MR-guided focused ultrasound today. And Nathan is leading many of these programs, both opening the blood-brain barrier transiently, and then very excitingly, they're using this in the lesional methodology where they are ablating a part of this, the subthalamic nucleus to treat patients with essential tremor, hopefully Parkinson's disease, and many others. And if you haven't seen these, just Google this online. There's some fantastic videos showing patients with tremors in the magnet and how this can be treated. Perhaps the most exciting one is the possibility to lower the amyloid concentration in the brain in patients with Alzheimer's disease, and that's undergoing initial trials. And our guided focused ultrasound ablation of prostate cancer, we've just started our program at the, at the Brigham, and this is one of our first cases from a couple of months ago. Um, obviously, the thermometry is extraordinarily helpful. The imaging defines a focal target in the, in the prostate to be treated. Uh, this is a man with intermediate risk prostate cancer, biopsy proven, met the selection criteria, received the therapy. You can see the pretreatment images here, and then these are during the treatment. You can see the transducer in the rectum, the energy being delivered, monitored through thermometry, and then post-treatment, the gadolinium demonstrating the necrosis in the small little area for focal therapy of prostate cancer. 
Um, and so now I'm going to change gears a little bit and finish the talk by sort of talking a little bit more about where we're going in the future. I want to share with you some, some new uh, research that's coming out of the Brigham and other places to really help us position ourselves for the next decade or so. So what's going on out there in the future, uh, the present? Big data, deep learning, and machine learning are clearly buzzwords that we saw, I think, from Sandy's nice slides earlier telling us about abstracts and what was, what's being presented here. So you're already in the game. So that's excellent. Keep up the good work. We need lots of help because the tools that are coming out are going to need a lot of help to really generate things that doctors will use in the clinic. And so very nicely, it was really informative. I'm sitting having breakfast this morning. I opened the New York Times, and there's an article in there about IBM and its Watson effort. Now, what's going on with IBM and, it, and what are all of these companies interested in, of course, is the data that's in the electronic medical records, that's in the hospital, the MRI data, the, all of the incredible information that we've been collecting somewhat randomly, I will caution you, for many, many years. And of course, longitudinal medical records, or EHRs, have only become mandatory in the United States since Obamacare was introduced. And they're still not mandatory everywhere, so beware of some of this data. But, but IBM and its wisdom has spent a lot of money in buying a lot of these systems, and lots of people are doing this. And using natural language processing techniques, I think they're going to help us develop tools that will aid the doctor. I know there's a concern in the community that they will replace the doctor, and believe me, I hope not. But I'm pretty sure that we will opt to use both the medical expertise and be it computer-aided tools or natural language processing or Watson or whatever the thing beside me in the office is going to be or in the radiology reading room, whatever is there to help integrate the vast amount of data that's coming out. And as, as, as Zach Cohen likes to say, medicine really is a little bit too important to be just left to doctors. There is so much information today. There's all of that genetic data that I shared with you. Is it a BRAF positive lung cancer or is it not? Does the radiomics tell me it's a big mass, it's touching the chest wall, it has speculated features? How can a non-radiologist and a non-geneticist analyze all of that in a 15-minute doctor visit with a patient? I mean, it's just impossible. So everything in the artificial learning space and artificial intelligence space is really, really helpful and important. But remember, as Andre would always caution us, there's data and there's data. There's clean data, there's well annotated data, and there's dirty data. So <laughs> be very careful about it. And there are data sets and there are lots of them out there. But another piece that I thought was really interesting, I read in, the, in, um, in something recently, I think Kaiser Permanente report, that over 50% of their patient doctor visits were now virtual on the west coast of California, which means that people are doing it from offices, from home, they're checking in with their doctors on their phones, and this may be California, no, not everybody in the world has a phone that's able to connect to their doctor yet. But it's amazing what's changing, and I think that's something that's important. We have to present our images and our data in very standardized fashions with standardized reporting, and that's sort of the radiology community pitch. We have to have a standardized lexicon for interpreting our rep uh, it, reporting out our findings, and this is something that I've worked really hard with with the prostate community, is to develop what's called PIRADS, which is the standardized lexicon and the standardized reporting of prostate MRI, and then a standardized assessment score at the end of each report, which says this is a prostate PIRADS 1, benign, normal, don't worry about it. It says PIRADS 4 or 5, this lesion must be biopsied and must be taken seriously because it must have, a, it pretty much uh, has a Gleason pattern 4 disease within it and that's clinically significant prostate cancer. So I don't want to go down the prostate again, but the reporting, the lexicon, and the wording is something that we in our community are wrestling with, making us all standardized and report in templates and in the same fashion, and get away from the arts and crafts, as Zerhuni would love to tell me, um, was the arts and crafts of radiology. We don't need to be in the arts and crafts business anymore. We need to be in much more protocolized, systematic, standardized, um, repeatable reporting systems that you can all understand no matter where you are at whatever time of the day or night in whatever country in the world. And so there are challenges and opportunities here. Data sharing, and this is a great editorial series that was in the New England, I guess when was that, last year sometime, but some good citations there. If you're interested in data sharing and what people think about people who share data and people who use each other's data, there's a little bit of a controversy in that space that I won't get into because it takes uh, people like Jeff Drazen and others more intelligent than I on the subject. So read what they have to say. Okay, so the, the cancer moonshot, you probably heard a little bit about this, this is the uh, Obama farewell to Joe Biden gift, um, which is currently not funded in the United States, but one of the things they reported in their blue ribbon panel report was they really want to see the cancer community, the cancer research community, develop small technologies, miniaturization, microdosing devices that can be test drugs in vivo. We have a huge problem with the drug development pipeline 
the pipeline is somewhere like 20 years and several billion dollars to develop a single drug. And why is that? Because we have to test in animals, test on tissue, put the tumor in, take the tumor out, analyze histologically, do it in randomized control trials, hugely long pipeline before a new drug gets into routine clinical use. How great would it be if we were able to have small little devices, such as I'm going to show you in a second, that you could put into a patient's tumor in vivo, test multiple drugs, and then determine how that tumor in that patient at that time responds to those drugs. And so we really want to try to get to the right drug at the right time. And so Oliver Jonas, that I'm happy to say has just joined our department, has been developing this with uh, Bob Langer's group at MIT and others to develop this tiny little micro device that you place inside a tumor and inside it, there are multiple reservoirs. Up to 40 drugs can be tested in a given time in this tiny little micro device that's implanted through a biopsy needle and then can be retrieved afterwards through resection of the mass. And you can analyze the space, and I'll show you in a second, the space around each area of tumor and drug and determine response, no response. And so this is the sort of thing I think we're going to see a lot more of and understand. And where does imaging and image guidance come into that? Well, where we're going to place that device, where we're going to put it inside a tumor and how we're going to get it in and then get it out again. Is it going to be a cancer that's going to be resected anyway? Well, that's easy. Or is it going to be one that we're going to have to take the device back out again? So I think that's in a very exciting new space that hopefully we'll be able to play a significant role in. And they're obviously working through issues with the IRB at the moment on that. And the other one that, that we're interested in in the prostate is really getting to the heterogeneity of the disease inside the prostate based on imaging, and then combining that through Natalie and Andre, hopefully, we'll be doing this in the future where we'll be combining mass spectrometry results instantaneously obtained on the biopsy tissue that we remove. So we'll be taking mass spectrometry into the breast and then onto prostate and testing its role in helping us know, have we sampled the most aggressive part of the tumor in that individual patient? Is there something else in there that we need to go back in and sample? And then one of the other big problems that we have in imaging and uh, in image guided intervention really is motion and trying to deal with motion and tracking devices. And so this nice work from Bruno Medor and Frank Price work, you'll see um, also in a minute with a video, is a small little organ-based sort of what they're calling an OCM, an organ configuration motion sensor. It's a tracker, it's not doing diagnostic ultrasound, um, but just placed on a patient, and the patient would have an MRI examination, and then come out of the magnet, and then have a procedure done under MRI. So essentially, using machine learning and synthetic real-time MRI imaging, after about less than about two minutes of training, they were able to develop this data set here, which is very similar to the acquired, showing beautifully the motion of that liver, because as we all know, every time we take a breath in and out, our liver moves up and down. So targeting focal lesions for therapy or biopsy is really problematic. And so some very nice work, which was illustrated, was presented last year here and is now in press um, in MRM, um, is really very helpful and I think will be a useful tool to translate the MR imaging into a much easier user-friendly space like ultrasound guided or outside the room in, in other, in even CT guidance, I guess, as well. And so another piece of work that Jay is working on at our place, which is going to be presented in this poster later on this week here in Athens, is the issue of needle, tr needle bending. Um, so during cryoablation, you can see cryoablation occurring here, the ice ball developing. The needle is placed first, and then the probe is placed beside it. And the tissues, as we all know, and you all know well at this meeting, each interface causes a deflection of the needle, and it can bend quite considerably. And so what Jay is obviously working on is trying to figure out the needle bending problem and try to solve that through various tracking methodologies. And as you all know, navigation systems come in many different forms and types. We have EM, we have optical, um, and how about trying to combine the best of both of those? And so this is what he's been working on using a Kalman filtered technique, which I will not explain because I will not understand it well enough, but you can go see the poster and you hopefully will understand it better. But anyway, this is gonna help enormously in tracking needles in real time space. And so really wrapping up very quickly here to conclude a little bit, the heterogeneity of a tumor is very important. One needs to understand what's going on inside it. We need very precise mapping. We need better surgical margins and surgical ablations. I'll skip over that. And then ultimately, what is the clinical impact of what we're doing? And I think the three programs that I've shown you today, we've been able to show through the imaging and in Amigo, the clinical impact in all of these cancers is really quite exciting and really important sort of to help disseminate these tools beyond the space in which we are in. And so really the important thing, of course, is the rewards to our patients and the benefits of those. 
And so really the future, I think, lies in patient-centric. And for all of you, again, the IT, the machine learning, the deep learning, the artificial intelligence, we're on that little highway in the middle of Boston. Don't expect to go very fast on that road, by the way. The Star Drive is incredibly slow these days. Um, but hopefully we will develop a strong lasting infrastructure, just like I saw yesterday. Um, if you need more information, uh, lots of websites to go to. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce to you my newest collaborators. We got two little puppies last weekend. So I want to thank you very much indeed for all your attention. I think we have time yeah. for a few questions. Thank Is you anybody? so much, um, Claire, for quite a tour de force. It was three talks in one, I think. Yeah. Nicola, we have 10 minutes for questions. Yes. So thank questions. you very much for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation. I noticed in, in one of the first slides where you were showing the type of interventions in the Amigo suite that you also had some cardiac interventions on dynamic uh, on a dynamic organ. Could you say a word about we, that? We started with that, and I didn't go into detail on that because we're not doing it as much anymore, but they are doing it outside Amigo. So we were working on it for EP, for cardiac um, physiological ablations, so the atrial fibrillation, working with Ehud Schmidt and um, um, Larry Epstein and the group in cardiac physiology. Most of that turned out to be too long and complicated for that space, so they went back to the cath labs. We had hoped to help them reduce the time, because as you know, with this um, atrial fibrillation problem, they're trying to ablate all these aberrant circuits around the pulmonary valve insertion. And we actually believe with imaging, we can show them where those are, as many of you are working on. Um, but it didn't, it didn't survive the Amigo test, which was sort of like, let's get it into reality sort of thing. So we moved it back to the cath labs. So that's probably why I didn't talk about it. Thank you. One more question here. Thank you for the uh, very encouraging presentation. So my question is uh, more, Precise localization and identification of the lesion often implies more radiation on the patients, like the intraoperative PET CT imaging. So, how do you see the risk of the extra dose? It's a good, very good question. We certainly don't want to increase the radiation dose and the toxicity. But to be honest, in patients with cancer and in certain stages of cancer, that diagnostic radiation is very minimal relatively over the big picture of what's going to happen to that patient. So not to belittle your point, though, I think that's why MRI and ultrasound are incredibly important to us. They're non-tox, non-radiation, uh, non-ionizing radiation, um, and very, very, very useful. And certainly that's where ultrasound and, and both MR and PET, of course, is, is radiation. So there's a real problem with the PET, I think, as well, because those tracers also emit within the space of the intervention as well. So that's definitely a concern. Do you have any more questions in the audience? Jane. We'll wait, Jen. Don't run. <laughs> Hi, Claire. Thanks. Not going anywhere in a hurry here. Yeah. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I have a, since you're one, a, a unique person that has the, the experience of the original double donut magnet. One of the few still left standing. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the Emirates system with the sort of sliding the patient in and out of things. What do you, what do you think about that in retrospect? Is there some advantages lost by not being able to maybe tr truly do things in the MR system uh, right there between the yeah. double donuts? So. It's, it's a great question, and I think there are some things we lost, and absolutely, I think Alex Gobi would repeat that as well. The reason we moved in one sense was the field strength issue. It was 0.5 in those days, um, and now, of course, we have three Tesla, and we just last week did the first anterior cervical discectomy infusion in the C-spine, and we did it all in the magnet. And so, yes, so some of the surgeons want to be entirely within the magnetic space. And this is where I think a lot of the magnetic field space. Um, robotics will be really important, um, certainly enabling technologies, things that will extend the arm and work within the space. So I think there'll be trade-offs for sure. The IMRIS is fabulous when you don't need to image a lot. Uh, it does take time to come in and go back out again, um, but it's, and it's pretty fantastic at the end of a neurosurgical case because it really stops the patient going to the ICU and having that bleed and trying to, you know. So there are trade-offs. I think it depends on the clinical scenarios. Yeah. Sorry, I can't come down and say I only want it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. If I may ask one question, um, people have been working quite hard of, um, on exploiting multiparatic MR in prostate cancer yep. um, to identify really where the potential uh, tumor is. Yes. And um, at the moment, it's used as an indication for, for, for targeted um, um, biopsy. Um, do, you, do you believe that at one point, 
in the next 10 years. We might be to a situation then uh, we can, through multiple applications, get quantitative Gleason score, quantitative value, mm -hmm. and then avoid completely uh, but, biopsy. Yes, I do. I think with diffusion imaging, we are definitely very close to that already. It's already shown that the lower the ADC, the much more likely, the lower the ADC, the higher the Gleason. And so the big thing is to find the Gleason pattern for. And we believe that most of the published literature, and, and you come from the home of Mark Emberton and all the people who've done a lot of this work, um, is really that we have a negative predictive value now for MRI in the sort of high 80s to even high 90s in some centers to rule out significant disease, as in Gleason 3 plus 3. So I think if we're there now for sure as we add other things or other MRI parameters, be it other forms of diffusion, multi-B, or um, RSI, or some of these other new techniques that are coming along to add into the MR, or using other non-invasive things like PET. There are a lot of people really excited about PET. Uh, certainly the um, PSMA tracer, the second generation tracer, looks interesting. Not so good, perhaps, inside the prostate, though. But I think we will get to a place where we'll say, so you don't need a biopsy, go home happy. Uh, sorry, you've got to stay on for a little longer. You know, that kind of di clinical dilemma. Thanks. Well, is there is no, any, oh, one more question, Nasia. You need to run, Nasia. No, 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 it's okay. Is, it, is this working? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's working. Uh, one question I have. Uh, are you also working, I don't know, these are amazing uh, developments, uh, but are you also working in this environment to also find solutions which would need, uh, I would say, which would be more cost effective, which could be transferred to uh, larger sets of setups which do not need MIRV or Amigo? So are you working on this direction to transfer some of this uh, in amazing technology, but also trying to reduce the requirements or adapt it to a more general Yep, scenario. so it's a great question. It, uh, almost every, every meeting I get asked at least once, for sure. Absolutely, um, you know, I think that imaging in operating rooms has now become an established fact of healthcare and it's very much a big development. What types of imaging and how much of imaging is needed is a very big open question. The lung cancer story is our first poster child example of moving out of Amigo into hybrid OR where all they have is Dyna CT or cone beam CT. And all they have is, that's better than fluoro and x-ray, I know. But th it will get better, that, that, that will improve all of the lung cancer nodule resection surgeries. The other one clearly is the registration of MR and ultrasound for prostate intervention. I think the work that we've seen this morning and we'll see the rest of the meeting, improving the ultrasound ability to, to understand and integrate the MRI gets it out into the ultrasound space, which of course can be in a doctor's office, maybe, you know, and other places where it can be done without being an Amigo for sure. The biopsy program is moving to a standard MRI scanner right now. It's, it doesn't need to be an Amigo either. So we're very cognizant of that. And I think that, you know, Amigo clearly is a platform that has not, doesn't have everything, but has a lot of stuff that, you know, in smaller programs you will not need or in more boutique operations. So the whole concept is to use it as an R&D pipeline and then spin out into smaller things. So absolutely, trying really hard. Thank you, and thanks for this amazing series of thanks work. Thanks for the Thank question. You. Thank you. Great. I guess it's a nice way to close. Thank you very much, Claire, and uh, now it's time for lunch. <laughs>